Do you have a dog who's had a CCL injury or surgery or work with dogs that have CCL injuries and surgeries, cranial cruciate ligaments? I'm Dr. Lori McCauley with Optimum Pet Vitality, and I want to go over with you the number one unrecognized complication and how to prevent it. Now, it's lost range of motion. Don't leave me yet. There's really important information here, I promise. Just hold on with me for just a second. The most common thing we see is loss of flexion of the tarsus on that same side and loss of extension in the knee or stifle. What that means is if he can't bend his knee and tarsus to be able to get his leg under him, because it hurts, he's gonna have all of his weight shifted to the other side. The other side's doing all the work. It has abnormal biomechanics every time he pushes off. So we don't wanna do sit to stand, sit to stand. That would be really bad because all we're doing is making that work harder and increasing the chance of inflammation, which could then increase the chance of rupture. So what does he do? He says, I am going to have my tarsus at, or hock at 90 degrees. I may externally rotate it. He's gonna bring it forward. He's gonna bring it out to the outside so that he's not bending it. And the question is, why doesn't he want to bend it? Well, because it's the exact same thing when we do cranial tibial thrust. We're saying, can we push that tibia forward and put stress on that cranial cruciate ligament? The job of the cranial cruciate ligament is to hold that tibia in place and not allow it to go forward. So when we, like when we're doing cranial tibial thrust, flex that hock or tarsus, we are pushing that forward. So again, sit to stand, sit to stand is pushing it again, again, and again. We don't want to stress those ligaments. We don't want to stress those fibers because, ouch, it hurts. They're doing it because it hurts. And we want to watch for inflammation on the opposite side. Really important, so very, very important. Infl or effusion or increased fluid inside the joint is the outward sign of inflammation inside the joint. That fluid has direct contact with the cradial and caudal cruciate ligament. And the inflammation is what makes it go bing, bing. The little fibers of the cranial cruciate ligament flick, flick until you have enough to have it be a partial CCL tear. Or poof, it blows, right? We don't want that to happen. So we want to watch for the inflammation on the other side. Back to the range of motion, but I had to put it in because it's so very, very important. With the range of motion, how do we know if there's a problem? We measure it. There's a goniometer that we can put on the knee and measure its flexion and extension, and then put on the hock and measure its flexion and extension. And we're doing passive range of motion when we measure. So active range of motion is what can the dog do? Passive range of motion is taking that further. That's what we're doing here. And we know what the numbers should be. Super, super important, right? One of my major points is you do not want to tell people or do, oh, just grab the toes and push it up and everything will bend, it'll be great. No, it won't. Actually, what happens is the joints that are hypermobile or normal, meaning too much motion or normal, will bend more. And the ones that are hypomobile, not moving the way they should, will not change because they hurt. So you're actually overusing some joints and not having the change that you want. What you really want to do is isolate each joint. So you want to flex the hip, then flex the knee, and then flex the hock. Always, always, always within their comfort zone. So flex the knee or flex the hip, stabilize above, flex the knee, and then come down below and flex the tarsus. When we extend the joints, we want to think, I always say it's like clapping. You take your hands and you bring them together. One's on the front of the knee and one's on the back of the hock. And as you bring them together, both joints extend. We want to have the hip in neutral and we always want to be within their comfort level. And please, please, please do not say, I'm going to work on extension of the tarsus. Never have problems with it, right? Well, very, very rarely. German Shepherd's my only breed. But I have seen people do this with either the carpus or the tarsus, and they cause irreversible damage. We do not want that. So we're going to do nice, gentle extension like this, and that's as far as we go. The other really important point I have is the 90-second rule. 
Remember when you were a kid and you dropped something on the floor and you go, whoop, five second rule. It's only been on the floor less than five seconds. I can eat it. In rehab, there is a 90 second rule. In humans, they say, if we're going to stretch something, we are going to stretch it for either 45 seconds, relax it, 45 seconds, right? Adds up to 90. Or we're going to do 30, 30, 30. Stretch, relax, stretch, relax, stretch, relax. I found before I even knew about the human stuff was 10 reps of 10 seconds. And you say, Lori, that's 100 seconds. I know, but it works really well and it's easy to remember. And I found with dogs, it works better than the 30, 30, 30 or the 45, 45. So you want to stretch and while you're stretching, massage the tissue that you're stretching, whether it be muscle, tendon, fascia, if nothing else, you're going to increase blood flow to the tissue and you may even be releasing some endogenous opioids or other chemicals that will make it feel better. All right. I'm Dr. Lori McCauley with Optimum Pet Vitality. I hope you had fun. I hope you learned something and I'll see you next time.